In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, today we're going to continue on and uh, with our study of uh, 1 Peter, and we're going to continue from where we left off. Um, last time we were in about uh, verse 10, and so let's go ahead and continue into verse 11. If you remember in verse 10 of chapter 4, uh, St. Peter was talking about spiritual gifts and how we use these gifts to serve one another for the common good, um, because the realization that these gifts don't belong to them. And so as he continues in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, he says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so these gifts called, uh, these gifts or, or these callings, are divided. They're divided into two kind of groups, those who speak and those who serve, or those who minister. And, you know, speaking gifts would include things like exhorting or counseling or teaching or prophecy, um, whereas the serving gifts would include things like healing and giving and showing mercy. And all, no matter what gift, no matter what category you find yourself in, the, these gifts are used in such a way as to give glory to God. They're not for the person themselves, so that um, the one who speaks should do so speaking the words uh, or oracles of God, receiving the words from God and acknowledging that they're his words, right, that the teaching uh, goes to him. And the one who serves should do so by the strength with that God supplies, again, acknowledging that the power comes from him. There's a nice quote from St. John Chrysostom that you see here. Um, there are different members in the church. Some are more honorable than others. For example, some celibates and widows, some married, and all complement one another. One's gift may be less than the others, but it may be indispensable, so that if that member is delayed from his job, many other jobs will be delayed. Be delayed. So we have to acknowledge that the talents that we have all work together for the collective good. And, and so by acknowledging God in their ministries, whether by speaking or by uh, serving in all things, right, we acknowledge God in everything that we do in our ministries, no matter what category that you're in, no matter what kind of servant that you're in, um, that God will be glorified through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whose name has been given to access uh, the good gifts uh, from God. And that glory might and might belong to God uh, forever uh, and to the age of all ages. Amen. Uh, in verse 12, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is uh, to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. And we see here kind of this transition. Um, St. Peter begins kind of like this other section. Now he's talking about, um, we, we know this because of, of the clue when he says beloved, right? The beloved, if you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 11, it's kind of the beginning of a new section. He says beloved. So um, it's kind of the same theme that he has. So he said, beloved, uh, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial that's going to come upon you. Um, his hearers have been enduring persecution. And so St. Peter alluded to, uh, where he was alluding to this fact in, in the previous section. Now he concludes his letter uh, with a series of teachings on how they are to cope with the, the difficult trials and, and living in this world. And so when they were pagans, his hearers fit right in with the world around him. Jews you know, might be accustomed to feeling out of step with the secular pagan world, but not these Gentile converts. Feeling out of step for them is actually something new for them, and it's uncomfortable. And they may be tempted to think that the fiery trial of being excluded or being mocked or slandered is strange. And, it, and sometimes it shakes that person. And, you know, they sometimes conform to, to more of the pagan world to just, just to avoid that that uncomfortable feeling of and feeling strange and being excluded. Uh, so St. Peter uh, assures them that their experience is not a strange thing happening to them, but a normal experience for a Christian, and that it's occurring as a test to purify them. So if we have that perspective, we won't feel it strange. We're going to expect that. We're going to feel uncomfortable with the world around us, and that's okay it, because it's, it, it shouldn't be a strange thing. We should expect that it's going to happen, and it will purify us. It's a test that's going to purify us. He says, in fact, in verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So it's bound to happen in this age that the church should suffer just as Christ did. 
So instead of being shaken by it, they should rejoice as they share in the sufferings of Christ. They get a taste of the cross because as they share his sufferings, they will share his glory as well. So at the revelation of that glory in the second coming, they will receive their reward and they will rejoice. Um, and we will see Christ rejoicing and sharing with them. It's an amazing promise. In verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So meanwhile, if they're reproached because they invoke the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're blessed because even now the spirit of glory and of God rests upon them. Um, the thought here is that the Holy Spirit is taking his, his home in a special way in the one who is reproached. It's a special experience. Um, he is called the spirit of glory and of God because he bestows a special glory on those that he rests on, filling them with the power of God, giving them a taste of final glory in the age to come. So they should not fear the reproach of their neighbors. Why? Because it will result in a greater fullness in the spirit. In verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. So in St. Saint, Saint Peter, in, in his, his insistence on doing good, it's clear that, you know, if a Christian is reproached by his neighbors, it shouldn't be because they're a murderer or a thief or an evildoer of any kind. He's saying, let the Christian keep the, the civil laws. Let them be a good citizen if they expect to be blessed by God when they suffer. So in the short list of crimes, you know, a murderer or a thief, St. Peter adds something that seems kind of out of place. He says, don't be a meddler. Don't be a busybody. It's a difficult word to translate in the Greek. It's literally someone who oversees the things of others. And it seems that St. Peter's point here is that Christians should not only, you know, not be criminal, uh, criminals, but they must take care of not annoying uh, their neighbors either. So it is possible that Christians may suffer reproach from their neighbors, but not because of activity that's, you know, like that's criminal, but simply because they're just too irritating and, and their, um, their rebuke of their pagan neighbors is unwanted. So politefulness and uh, politeness and thoughtfulness are also uh, Christian virtues that St. Peter is saying here. And in verse 16, and yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. If anyone does, does suffer as a Christian, however, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in, in that name. The term Christian nowadays often is a title of honor, and um, whereas originally it was a title of insult, like if you think of it like the term of like a Jesus freak right? It's, it's intent is to be an insult. And actually, uh, the, the term Christian was, was coined by the pagans of Antioch. It was a slander. It was a, it was a term of, uh, to hurt. And so even though this term Christian is hurled in the face like a swear word, um, that person, that believer should not be ashamed of the insult because it contains the holy name of Christ. No, rather let him glorify God in the name that is thrown in his face and give thanks that he's able to suffer for his Lord. In verse uh, 17 to 19, this is the end of chapter four. Um, let's read it. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will I, the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And so as we end chapter four, um, St. Peter ends this chapter by saying, you know, suffering is going to happen. It's, it's just a matter of time. And it means that in the, appoint, in the appointed time for the judgment to begin for the children of men. So men have to choose for or against Jesus Christ. And, and it means that the last judgment is drawing closer and it's drawing near and that the end of ages have come uh, at last. And as the old, in the Old Testament, where God began the judgment by judging and sifting his own people, so it is now. 
judgment began from the sanctuary, the temple, and, and now the final judgment begins from the house of God, the church. And the church is being judged, and it's being sifted and purified first, and then it'll be the world's turn. So for St. Peter, this is the significance of the persecution in this age. It is God's sifting of the people, testing them, purifying them through suffering, and the beginning of the final judgment of all. And if the suffering of God's own people is severe so that the righteous is saved with difficulty, right, with suffering, what will be the end for the, the godless, the one who is sinner, right? Those not obeying God's good news of Christ. It's a scary thought. How much worse will the suffering uh, is stored up for them at the last judgment? So the perspective here is that those who are suffering, indeed, according to the will of God, right, for the Christian faith, should commit their souls and their lives to a faithful creator. Their God is the creator of all men and will therefore judge them all. The Christian should entrust their eternal welfare to him uh, because he is faithful and will keep them for eternal life. And the way to commit themselves to him is in doing good. And, and this is the way they commit themselves to God's care and his judgment. And so we'll begin a little bit of chapter five, um, just for uh, you know, the sake that we have uh, time uh, to continue. And we see in chapter five, St. Peter is concluding his letter and he calls for unity. Um, he sees uh, the need to address pastoral relationships and he gives advice to pastors and, and priests. He gives advice to the flock and then he concludes and then he kind of wraps up the letter um, uh, completely. And so we'll begin. It, chapter five is only 14 verses, so I'm not going to go too far into it. So, I, so by the time we have the last recording, um, we'll, we'll really focus on chapter five, but I'll probably begin with like the first uh, handful of verses. In chapter five, verse one, we read, um, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Because of the, the matter of timing of suffering, St. Peter makes his appeal to the church leaders. Um, and it was, it was the responsibility of the clergy uh, to care for the believers and to prepare them to endure uh, their hardships. And in making this appeal, St. Peter brings forward his, um, his personal authority, right? He, he exhorts the elders of uh, the church, and he says that he's also a co-elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a sharer of the glory about to be revealed. And that is, he's an elder too, and he has responsibility for ruling the church. He is also a witness of the sufferings of Christ, the one who can attest to the hostilities that he endured, which set the path for us that we follow in his way. So he is a sharer also of the glory about to be revealed at the second coming, and so that he awaits that coming eagerly as they do. So he puts himself in the fold. And it's this, you know, there's like three different descriptions of himself. St. Peter places himself in solidarity with his fellow leaders, encouraging them by his personal example, as well as, um, you know, we note that great humility of, of St. Peter, who is content to place himself simply as a fellow elder like him. He doesn't stress his status as a leader of the 12, right? He doesn't do that. But his appeal is um, the elders among his hearers, right? That is to the, to the priests and not just to the older men. Um, and that is that they should uh, shepherd or rule the church with zeal um, because it's not their flock ultimately, but it's the flock of God. Right? It's a beautiful kind of beginning of this conclusion of this chapter five. And we see in chapter, uh, sorry, in verse two, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, uh, not for a dishonest gain, but eagerly. Okay, and I think I'm going to end here for today, um, but we'll, we'll talk about this verse and then we'll end here. And so they have to serve as bishop, uh, not by necessity, not by compulsion, not serving their brethren by dragging their feet, but voluntarily and willingly, according to God, because he has appointed them to that service. You know, reluctance to the service as clergy was, um, was all the more likely during times of persecution, when clergy and their families were their first targets. 
And so, you know, it was, it was common a place that the clergy were hesitant to, to be that zealous um, uh, shepherding the flock when they're being persecuted and attacked. And, and so that temptation comes. And so, um, and so they shouldn't do, they should not do it uh, shamefully uh, for gain, right? For, for dishonest gain. Uh, as men motivated, they're, they're motivated by money, but they should do it readily, eagerly, as motivated by the love of God and his people. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you for, uh, for being with us for this part. And we'll continue on and to conclude chapter five in the next, um, in the next recording, and then we'll be finished with our study of First Peter. Thank you so much.